Garvin, would you do us the honor yes, of the invocation? Father in heaven, Lord of all things, we thank you for this beautiful fall day. We thank you for the way you continue to bless us each day. We ask now that you would be with each of us, be with our guests, be with the staff, be especially with the Cherokee Nation. Forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Meredith Fraley, here. Bill England, here. Bill John Baker, here. Jack Baker, here. Harley Buzzard, here. Julia Cubs, here. Bradley Cobb, Ani. John Crittenden, here. Jody Fishinghawk, Janelle Fulbright, here. Don Garvin, here. Chuck Foster Jr., here. Tyler Glory Jordan, here. Curtis Snell, Chris Soap, here. David Thornton, here. Taylor Callum Watts. Uh, we do have a form. We have a form. Make sure to send the approval of the August 26th regular session uh, committee meeting. Move to be approved. Second. Move to be second. Any discussion on the August 26th minutes as written? Uh, uh, shall we make that correction? Yes, I handed it out. Okay. So we're all walking into the sixth All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All in favor, same sign. Here. <laughs> I'm down to reports. Uh, Miss Wright, she's here from there. <laughs> Just slid in. Yeah, I mean, How are all? Is everybody? Nice weather, huh? Yes. Yeah. You've got my report for September, no, for August. Do you have any questions on it? Questions for Mr. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hammonds? Good afternoon. Um, in addition to the written report, a couple of court dates are coming up. The Majewski tribal case is currently still on the docket for tomorrow morning in tribal court. And um, the Nash case is scheduled in tribal court next Wednesday. If any of you would like to attend that. Are there any questions? Any questions or comments, Commissioner Morton? Uh, yes, Mr. Hopkins. I had asked and I had turned you know, to provided some information on the recent treatment filings in which the Department of Interior, if I'm reading it right, asserts that the Constitution in which we operate is not something they've approved. I mean, can you walk, I mean, that, that caused me some anxiety reading that. Uh, can you kind of walk me through that issue? I, I know our time is brief here. And, uh, can you repeat that? Uh, yeah, Madam Speaker, there, there was a, a recent filing in the Freedman case in which the Department of Interior asserted in one of its filings that the 76th Constitution is the Constitution that it, it recognizes. I know there's, I know it's a big document, so I know it says different things in different places, but uh, have you become familiar with that issue and can you speak to it at all? Because that's what I'd ask the Attorney General to do, is to speak to that at this meeting. If you could. I am not involved in that case directly. I do know that um, she had given you some items by email. I don't know what dates those are, but that address that issue. Well, what I and I hope she'll be here at our next meeting or someone that is on the case. And I understand you're not on the case um, because the Department of Interior says, at least in one section, that it's recognized in the '76 Constitution, and that's a very. I know it's not the first time we've heard that issue, but it, it may be the first time I've heard it read it in a legal brief by the U.S. government. And I think it's it's so alarming that it, it ought to warrant a, a report to this body from the Attorney General to kind of give us some reassurances or, or explain to us why there's some reason to feel we're in peril. Okay. That's certainly what I take away from reading it, and that's what I tried to impart to her in my uh, email to her. So if the Attorney General's office is not prepared to respond, I guess we're going to be in there to speak to us. We'll re take it up next month. Nathan, can we bring that forward next month? Yes, ma'am. Or McCann Who's working on that case from our end? Ms. Hammonds? Ms. Hammonds. Okay. And I, I will be appearing 
on her behalf on Wednesday in the tribal case, but I am not involved in the other case and not familiar enough to give this body um, a detailed description or synopsis of the case. Okay. Appreciate you being here. Mr. Hoskins, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I, I actually had asked her some questions about the UKB issue. Um, and I think she she passed the document out, but are you involved in the UKB issue at all? Uh, no, I'm not. Address. I understand. Well, essentially the issue I wanted to resolve is I wanted to see the, the underlying statute that says that Cherokee Nation has to give its consent before land can be taken into trust because there's an issue about whether it's <coughs> consent or just to give some input. And I believe she did send me some, at least some materials from a brief and okay. gave some case law. But that's the other thing I'd like to see addressed at our next meeting is, is to speak to that issue. Because this is another issue when I, uh, some of the things I read gives me real reason to be alarmed. And I think the whole committee uh, should be alarmed at these things as well. And you want the um, text of the statute? Well, I, I just, and, and I'd like, uh, frankly, just sort of a, a, an oral report in addition to the written documents to sort of walk us through what those issues are reassure us that we have some firm legal ground that we're standing on. Uh, so the next report, that's what I'd like to see. Okay. Some, some robust discussion of that. Okay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Nathan, can you get copies of that prior to the meeting to, to all council members? Would that be possible? Yes. Okay, appreciate it. And I'll check through the email stream because she did send me copies of some so I could read. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Morton? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Election Commission, Mr. Johnson. Good Madam Speaker, Council. Uh, in addition to the monthly report that I'm sure you all have already read, uh, we did submit uh, a memo uh, concerning precinct locations. And because that's uh, an agenda item number five, I'd rather reserve any comments or any questions until that time. And at that time, I would like to read that letter for the record. Fine. Any other questions or comments aside from that? Thank you, Mr. Thank Johnson. Swifton Tax Commission. Hello. Hello. I'm here. Ms. Swifton's on travel, so we got the report if there's any questions. Any questions? Comments? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hanby, self-governance. Good afternoon, Nikki. Um, I have a couple of uh, updates that I would like to give. Um, first of all, on uh, on the Recovery Act, we received uh, uh, some additional funding. Uh, the largest has been. Uh, on our roads program, uh, we received two million dollars of the redistributed funds. In other words, uh, funds that was left out nationally that had not been used were uh, gathered back up and then they redistributed to try in order in order to try to use those uh, uh, funding at the national level. Uh, but anyway, we received two million dollars of that, so that speaks highly of our roads program and that they're doing a, doing a good job and they were given additional money to use. Um, Vicki, were there any restrictions on that? I didn't hear. It's actually for a particular roads project. Uh, again, remember that those are supposed to be shovel ready or projects that we're ready to do construction on. And that particular project is going to be the Honey Hill Road. Uh, and that's what that $2 million will be used for. Um, child care also received a, a small increase of about $26,000. Uh, so they got additional money as well. Um, <coughs> two major things that I wanted to update you on. Um, again, with the roads program, uh, we attended the consultation meeting that was held in Oklahoma City on the 21st. Um, that was the largest attended uh, meeting that they've had nationally. We had uh, um, a number of the county commissioners statewide uh, showed up. We had some state officials uh, also attend. Um, but again, it was the largest attended meeting that they had held nationally. Um, 
some of the changes that are going to be taking place, um, the funding formula is, even though it was a consultation, um, the implementation of the BIA and Federal Highway interpretation as the funding formula distribution will be implemented uh, at the first distribution of funding in 2011. So, in other words, they held a consultation the 21st saying in 2011, this is how the money is going to be distributed. Um, we have some issues with, with that, of course, which we've, we've talked to you before about. Um, first of all, we have an issue that, uh, that the question 10 and the funding formula went through negotiated rulemaking. Uh, I specifically asked that question of the officials that were there, and the response is that they are not changing technically the regulation or what is quoted in the reg for question 10. They're changing the interpretation of question 10. So that's, that was their official response to that. However, it is changing a funding formula and Oklahoma will be one of the largest uh, affected by that formula change. Um, <coughs> they will, there will be a uh, transition year in 2011 uh, and then it will be fully implemented in 2012. Um, the uh, uh, Oklahoma Tribal Transportation Council uh, submitted to them a resolution uh, in opposition of the formula change um, and we can get you a copy of that if, if you would like to see that. Um, also I have the handout that they uh, presented at that meeting and, and you're welcome to, uh, to view that as well at, should you so choose. Uh, Vicki I'd like a copy of both of those uh, memos and then the, the other question I have and you may not know the answer to this right now but do we have an estimated cost or estimated amount that the Cherokee Nation would lose from our funding? <coughs> and then an overall cost, what the state of Oklahoma would lose from the other 38 tribes? Do we well, have that's a chance a, to look at that yet? That's a very good question, and there's so many variables that it's hard to, to pinpoint that. Because, um, and I might also add that um, they've instituted a grandfathering clause that states that, uh, let me find it here, um, for any inventory prior to 2005 will continue to generate 100% regardless of the ownership and class. So they basically said whatever inventory was in 2005 prior will remain as a grand, the grandfathered into the formula. Anything, uh, any inventory that any tribe has input after 2005 uh, is going to be under this new rule. So it's, there are so many variables that, uh, and I'm not sure if anybody has run those numbers, uh, but I do know that uh, uh, Oklahoma and Alaska will be the largest affected. And it would be negative, negatively affected, I should say. Um, one other thing, I just got word today that uh, the Senate Indian Affairs Committee has announced that they will hold a field hearing to examine tribal transportation in Indian, Indian Country October 15th on the Flathead Reservation. I just got word of that uh, before I came over today. Um, the other update that I have for you is in regards to Title IV. Um, as I've reported in, in previous months, we've worked for a number of years to try to get Title IV amendments passed, which is basically getting Department of Interior up to basically the same standards as IHS. Um, uh, Boren introduced a bill it was it passed the house um, we 
we're working with the Senate to try to get the House version passed before recess. And uh, I don't fully understand the terminology that's used, but it was basically to hold the bill at the desk. Uh, I don't understand congressionally exactly what that means, but basically we were trying to get it uh, passed before recess. Uh, Dorgan was in favor of that. However, uh, Barrasco wanted it to go through the regular process. There's still a, a small window, I believe. Uh, Paula might know more about that than, than I do, but uh, there may be a small window that there's still a possibility that we can get Title IV amendments passed. But uh, one other issue is that the Congressional Budget Office issued a report that estimated a $5 million uh, impact, uh, which we also disagree with that, uh, how they arrived at that. But anyway, that's uh, that's the updates that I have, unless you have any other questions. Any questions for Ms. Handy? Good. Yes. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Mr. Hummingbird here, or anyone from the gaming? Oh, there you are. Forward. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm just so quiet and unassuming you missed me sitting in the back row. I completely missed you. Why did everybody laugh when I said that? Uh, I apologize for the lateness of my uh, report, but I did bring copies and pass them out uh, before the meeting today. Um, one I missed over here. Um, the only thing I need to supplement with this is. Um, we have the National Tribal Gaming Commissioners and Regulators meeting in Green Bay next week. It's a fall conference, and uh, uh, I'll be up for re-election as chairman of the organization again. So I wish, uh, hopefully, you can wish me luck for that. And um, if you haven't uh, made plans to attend one of our sessions, we're going to have another spring conference uh, sometime in March. And once that, uh, we'll be setting those dates this time. Once we get those dates and uh, locations set. I'll be uh, sending out notices to you also. Hopefully, you'll be able to join us at one of our conferences in the future. So, other than that, um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to do my best. Questions or comments from Mr. Hemingbury? Thank you. Thank you Great much. report. Mr. Hemingbury. You're about there, aren't you? Well, I promise to be quiet and unassuming. You'll, hopefully, you'll ignore me, too. <laughs> <laughs> No, the, um, we are still waiting for our um, um, quote from West. Um, I have not got a chance to meet with Mr. Uh, Morton uh, uh, this month on qualification. Um, uh, again, uh, our work uh, uh, last month was, was very significant, and uh, the uh, help of the interns have uh, paid off, and they have promised to uh, uh, or made the offer to uh, continue on to see the project through, to which we're both greatly uh, appreciative, both me and Mr. Morton. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, by next month, we'll, we'll have our bids in for, or our offers from uh, uh, West, and uh, we'll, we'll have some pricing to uh, give to you. Great. Other than that, that's, that's my report. And you're working closely with Shelley, too, on the Village Star on the yes. application. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have anyone from the New Tribal Council that are listed on the agenda? This is their time to report. They report quarterly and uh, right. moving on down to old business. We have an act prohibiting elected officials from curing or participating in media advertisements. Uh, Mr. Hoskin, do you want to bring that forward? Madam Speaker, I'd like to move the table that for one month. Okay. Second. And second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. <coughs> Motion carried. Table for one month. Item two is uh, this amends the election saw law assigning seat designation. Mr. Garvin. Yes, Madam Speaker, this is uh, assigning seats for this. New five districts, and uh, <coughs> each district could have three seats. And, uh, uh, <coughs> as you see, in the book there, uh, some of them are six year terms, and some four. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> I think it's 
So I make a motion to be approved as submitted. Okay, a second. Second. Need second discussion. Uh, Mr. Baker. Uh, is there any clarification we can do on the six-year terms, knowing that there are only going to be four-year terms from this point forward? <coughs> uh, just, just to clarify it so it's not in the law that those are six-year terms from now on, which I realize <coughs> is not. Everybody here does. But just a clarification. It <coughs> says that it's either a four-year term or a six. And, and although they were six, at the end of this term, they'll no longer be. Mr. Gardner? It started out as a six-year term. When we started talking about it, I don't think we can call it anything else but a six-year term. I know it's yeah, going to have six long. more to go. But, uh, yeah. I'd say not change the terminology later back then. No, I mean, the, and, and uh, the, the, clar the clarification, in my opinion, comes in the... Uh, uh, the on the, the paragraph right after District 5 it says to enact the provisions of Legislative Act 707 all four year terms shall be up for election in 2011 all six year terms shall be up for election in 2013 thereafter all tribal council terms shall be four year terms uh, and that that and, you know that just brings forth the uh, the uh, uh, the major issues of, of Legislative Act 707 so I think it, I think it's clear um, Mr. Baker? Yeah. 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 Is there questions? Comments? Have a motion and a second. All in favor? Say <coughs> aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. By acclamation. By acclamation. That's an act, so. Sorry. Uh, Under uh, new business, item one is a resolution authorizing. Uh, uh, the Cherokee Nation comes in from the National Congress of American Indians. I'll move for approval. Thank you. Uh, and discussion? Yes, please. Um, we hadn't got a chance to finish the conversation. Is this the, really the list of delegates? Because I got caught at Rapid City and there weren't staff wise, there weren't folks to back up the lack of elected officials. So I need to know if at this time, or at least maybe we consider an additional list when it goes to full council. Because the sh sh staff list is short, and it became obvious at Rapid City. If we need people to hang out and vote. Okay. So, um, if, Madam Speaker, so it could be that we've amended at full council since we didn't get to finish that conversation outside the room. Okay. And we'll have that prior to full council in an email if there are amendments, who the additional staff people. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Critton? <coughs> uh, I, just, I was just seconding. She made the motion. I oh, okay, That's sorry. all I have. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All the same time. Motion carries. A motion to amend the agenda to include the veterans donation. Isn't that in this meeting? It's not yeah, in have right? a motion to amend the agenda to include. Do we have that in front of us? Yes, sir. So it should be a copy in front of you for the donation. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying, up uh, to amend the agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Okay, uh, Carol, we'll have that as item number 10. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, item two is a resolution authorizing a um, boxing mixed martial arts compact with the state of Oklahoma. Okay, I'm the sponsor. <laughs> Move to the is proposing holding sporting events, including boxing and martial arts, and uh, to ensure proper sanctioning and uh, regulations of these types of events. <coughs> they consider it most advantageous to enter into a compact with the state of Oklahoma and making use of their experienced regulators. Um, before you here is a resolution authorizing uh, this compact with the state of Oklahoma. It's for one year and consecutive terms of one year unless either party gets 30-day termination notice. Um, events are regulated by the state under the Professional Boxing Safety Act, the State Athletic Commission Act, and, and its rules. And if there should uh, be a dispute, um, of course, if negotiations fail, uh, would be subject to binding arbitration and subject only to the federal 
district court uh, within within that jurisdiction. Uh, I do have one question. Uh, maybe this for you, Dave. I see that on paragraph five, I see that the state is compensated for the commission's services. How is CAE compensated? Just through the the event itself? Yes, we do the economics on the event uh -huh. based on the number of people and the advertising and overflowing the people and so on. So we just look at all of that and economics and a potential payment from the uh, person who's putting on the event. It's a combination of all those things. Okay. I would move for approval. Second. Moved and second. Now discussion. Uh, Ms. Fishinghoff. I'm curious about why didn't we look at the uh, poll audience? Don't they have a commission? Uh, well, we looked at the, at the state because of their history, and it's, it's so well defined, and they do such a good job. $1,500. It was just uh, the evaluation. But it's called a long discharge, because I know they do creep nations. They're boxing it in. Do they? Yeah. Uh, Bob, uh, I, I don't know. We didn't. <coughs> Any further questions or comments? Yes. Well, Jordan. David, why would we not want to look at another tribal entity to assist <laughs> us until we can uh, bring forth our own rules? You know, we, I don't know. I mean, we, we just looked at the state and looked at all their, their very well, well defined, well organized. Are we, we're waiving our sovereign immunity, though, and, and agreeing to be uh, sued in federal court should there be a dispute? Only to the extent. No. Uh, yeah, we're not waiving our sovereign immunity. We're agreeing to binding arbitration for a limited purpose, which is... Uh, yeah, that arbitration really worked out with the smoke shops, didn't it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't, we don't anticipate there will be... Really, any, we didn't any anticipate problem. anything with the smoke shops either. Well, we would, right. if we, with regards to what organization, we would, we would have to agree to some arbitration provision. So I don't think we're going to get out of having to resolve the dispute. So I don't think we're waiving a sovereign unit to that extent. Well, I trust my Indian brothers a lot more than I trust the state at this point. <laughs> There, there is a, a hold harmless provision in paragraph 6, I noticed, right. and also in paragraph 10, uh, <coughs> appears to implicitly avoid a waiver, uh, saying that state law does not apply to the Cherokee Nation or its citizens regarding activities in Indian country. Uh, Tyna, were you wanting something more specific? Is that what I, I would like something more specific. It just seems like... When I first came on the council, we were being very careful about waiving anything. Mm -hmm. And now it's just becoming a normal course of business. Every time somebody approaches us or we do dealings with outside entities, we just offer up a waiver. Uh, I think it needs to be clear in the agreement that that's not so, that we still treat that as a very sacred uh, item to be dealt with. And, and also, I, I really don't think it would hurt us to explore this idea of working with another tribe to provide the same thing that the state of Oklahoma is providing us. Well, I think, uh, Jamie, do you have a question? Uh, Mr. Army do you want to come forward? Uh, if I might, uh, this is something that um, I looked into er, a little bit earlier this year, and one of the things that uh, I, like you, would be interested in finding out exactly how that relationship works, because as I read uh, the federal statutes that govern boxing for Indian tribes, there's only two ways that I know <coughs> that you can do it outside of doing it yourself. That is either compact with the state in which you reside, or you contract with the American Boxing Commission, the, the federal uh, equivalent to like the NIGC. So if, if you do it one of those two ways, you still have to get into an agreement with that outside group. The way I'm reading the, uh, the federal statutes, uh, agreements with other jurisdictions, i.e. a state to a state or a tribe to a tribe, uh, can't be done. But if they are doing that, which I, I don't doubt your word, uh, if they're doing it, I'd be interested in exactly how they do that. But I think as far as the, the agreement between the tribe and the state, 
goes, uh, that is definitely permitted within uh, the uh, the federal laws. Could I continue, Madam um, Would it be, uh, is it essential that we pass it this month, or could we have a month to have you just look into this option a little bit more? Well, we have an event scheduled for November, so I have to meet with the Tribal Relations Committee prior to that point, so it is kind of of the essence now. Because we do that, that doesn't mean that we, it precludes us from working with uh, uh, the Potawatomis if they have a system. So I think if we go ahead and pass this, we can move on, and then we can look at these other options, and if it turns out that they uh, pass the test and meet our requirements, then we would be inclined to use them. I, I agree with you. Uh, but I think we wanted to rely on because the state has done it. There's no question about how they work and their uh, their systems and all of that. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and get this option available for us so we could go ahead and continue with the understanding that we would look at the bottom of these and if it is viable, we'll present it. Well, the only problem I see with that, David, is number four is locking you in to just working with the state during the duration of this compact. So if we pass this, there won't be any need looking anywhere else because you're already locked in to this option okay. under the number four paragraph as I read it. Yeah, if I might, uh, one of the things I read in there too is that we do have the ability to opt out within 30 days notice. Yeah. So if we are able to go ahead and get this executed for expediency for this uh, November <coughs> event, that can still allow the tribe time to talk with Potawatomi's uh, to set up something outside and conserve notice once the, an arrangement could be made if that is indeed what we choose to do. Um, also, something to keep in the back of your mind is Mr. Miller, who's over the State Boxing Commission, is Potawatomi and helped set up the Potawatomi Boxing Commission. So, in, in that sense, we do have a tribal uh, member that we would be dealing with on a uh, on a top level basis for the Boxing Commission for the state. That's all the questions. I have. Thank you. I, I realize this isn't a gaming compact. It's not the intent, but. Right now, under <coughs> any Game Regulatory Act or our compact, could we sanction and regulate gambling on sporting events like MMA? No. Would it take a change in the compact, federal law, both? Uh, both. Uh, so federal law, there's only one jurisdiction in which you can legally bet on um, gambling, and that's in Las Vegas. You can't even do it in Atlantic City or anywhere else. Uh, so I mean, as far as sports book type betting, Vegas is your only option. So it, it would take a, a federal law change. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? A motion and a oh, second. Can, can, just a point of clarification on what he just said. You're saying that we cannot regulate it ourselves and take bets? Not on sporting events, no. Okay. It would have, we would have to go through the National Gaming yeah, it, it, yeah, even NIGC couldn't uh, sanction or allow that. that. That's something outside of uh, uh, Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, and that's that's something that is a much broader um, stroke, if you will, when it comes to gaming um, or, or or sports wagering, uh, because there, there's only, like I said, that one jurisdiction that I know of that you can legally bet on sporting events, and outside of Las Vegas, I've never seen it done anywhere else. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just, I guess logistically, I was trying to figure out how this worked, and I don't know anything about boxing or whatever is going on here. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so you guys get in the ring. <laughs> well, <I've laughs> so anyway, does your commission, even if, like, if we compact, if we do this with the state in lieu of another tribe or doing it ourselves, mm -hmm. there, is there still a step in this process where our commission oversees what's going on? So it's not just CNE management making those decisions, and maybe your commission would be able to trigger 30 day relief if we needed to. I think that would bring comfort to what was been raised in my mind. If that was part of the logistical, like, Right. <clears throat> so anytime they had a fight, um, that you're part, you are you are part of this process still. Our gaming commission. 
as as this compact is is written, uh, we would not have a, a hand in any of the events themselves. Now, there's ancillary activities outside of the event itself that we would have to have uh, involvement in, as far as emergency preparations, making sure that there's uh, uh, enough ambulances and police and fire protection, those types of things in but place. But not part of the licensure process. For but, this? but as far as the uh, boxing or the MMA, the fight itself, uh, that would be handled through the Oklahoma Boxing Commission. Even internally, there's no triggers for you. In no. No. This would uh, the Boxing Commission would be uh, responsible for all aspects of the event, from essentially from set up to tear down, as far as. Uh, Arranging the event, getting the fighters, getting the uh, uh, judges, and making those types of arrangements, all that would be on the Boxing Commission. We would just handle anything outside of that. May I ask one more question? So, so like, you don't even like, like, we have our tarot vendors being investigated by you for licensure, but we're not going to have these folks invest, like, given the same license yet? Uh, as far as by us, <coughs> No, that would again. That would fall upon the boxing Oklahoma Boxing Commission to to do all the backgrounding, whatever backgrounding it is that they would do, whether it be on the vendor, excuse me, on the promoter or on the fighter. Is there something time sensitive about this then? Because we have a fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's an event uh, uh, scheduled for the. No, well. So. Is she sure you want to come forward? Can I, can I call in? The reason we pay the state. Yeah, the reason we're doing this is that if you would look at all the process and procedure that the state does on this, this is what we are paying for. So they have all of the procedures in place to test from a health standpoint, from a, you know, they make sure there are doctors there, they make sure that the fighters are licensed, they make sure they weigh in. And so they take responsibility for that, soup to nuts, so that we aren't involved in it. What we look at... I mean, so that's what they do. We don't need anybody else to do it twice. And, and I appreciate that. I, I'm not concerned. I mean, I, I'm sure they're quite competent, or we would hear about it in the news. That, 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 yeah. But do they assume all the liability on our property, whether it's tribal trust land or fee simple? Uh, and then here, I'm still concerned that there's not some allowance of a trigger internally that our own gaming commission wouldn't have some ability to do well, something. Well, first of all, it's not gaming. <coughs> okay, that's that's. Well, I don't think issue. our tarot vendors are gaming either, but they get licensed. So I'm I'm just struggling they, with they how get we licensed. do this consistently. They get licensed because they are potentially associated with gaming. That's the reason they are licensed is because if they are close to a gaming machine or uh, the systems or around money. That's why they license. What this is is an event that is in uh, the convention center or the joint, and basically the boxing commission comes there. They, you know, they, they test the fighters and make sure it all works. They're responsible for that, and I'm sure they have some liability for not doing it right. I'd have to look at the legal ramifications of that. But uh, the gaming commission has responsible for emergency procedures, safety of our patrons in general, so what they do is they say, okay, when you're coming on our property, uh, you've got, you know, fire escapes, you've got, uh, you know, all of those things, you've got security, and they will look and approve of that overall safety and security plan. So they are involved in it to the extent that, you know, they make sure we're being prudent in all of those issues. But in terms of the event, the money, who we use, we follow the procedures, uh, procurement procedures on that that are established. So I think we have... And Someone I appreciate down the, line. the detailed explanation on the part where the gaming our gaming commission is not involved. Mm -hmm. But prior to full council, I would appreciate some kind of response that indicates some liability risk that if the state doesn't do their job, who becomes responsible? You know, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and so. <laughs> yeah, well, if they're required to do something and they don't do it, then I think that's what we're paying for is that they would be open to liability. But that's just a fundamental law. For me to have a vote on it, I need more than a thing. Act, and I know that it's regulated, and not only regulated, but the, the state must apply and enforce the federal law as well as state law. Right. I mean, that, that's their job, and so mm -hmm. that's why everybody uses uh, them, because they don't have the expertise, and we even looked at doing it in-house. 
and it's just very expensive, and it creates actually more liability, I think, for us to do it than for them to do it. Yeah, I'm not concerned. I'm, I'm not. I'm comfortable with that part of the decision. I just need something. With the, the responsibility that this body has for my vote, I would like something in writing that says, if the state doesn't do their portion, who becomes responsible? I just need some whole, assurance. There's a whole harmless clause in there. <coughs> So, Madam Speaker, you're saying that, that is, that's the comfort zone for the non lawyer on the council. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mr. Stewart, did you have something? Well, I, I think you can feel comfortable that even when non Indian you know, tribes con con or work with the state, they have to go through all this legal issue as well. So, this is well established for years on. Who, who does what? So I, I think you can feel comfortable that there is established law. I know, but I, anytime you or anyone else, and even myself, when I start saying I should be comfortable and I think, and it has to do with the tribe, I get, okay, we well, always end up, I, I would rather vet that. Before full council, I need more comfort zone on that. But I appreciate what you pointed out, Smith. We, we can outline that. <laughs> um, just carrying her uh, curious conversation a little bit further. As I see paragraph six, we're agreeing if the state makes a mistake, we can't do anything about it. If somebody sues, we're totally the one on the stick, not the state. I would like to see number six taken out, basically. If well, we're we gonna pay them $1,500 to do their job, then they should be comfortable with doing their job and we are to be able to come back on them if they make a mistake. Yeah, I, I don't think that's negotiable. I mean, they're, well, they're no. If I was them, I wouldn't negotiate yeah. it either. Yeah. It puts all the liability on us, David. You almost had me. I was almost going to vote for it, but I, I had a lot of heartburn with us having all the liability. Let's say they make a mistake and let a fighter fight, and he's got a head injury and he's killed. The state well, walks away with their fifteen hundred dollars. Well, I think we get releases from them before they do that. Well, I mean, this let's is say something it's gross they negligence, though. A release won't help you. Let's say there's some gross negligence involved, and somebody looks the other way. The guy's had ten concussions, and he has the eleventh in our ring yeah. and dies. And oh, his sure. widow and kids decide, hey, we got to have some money for the rest of our lives. So we're going to do. Or we're this number six takes the state out of being liable for any mistakes they may have made in letting that fighter proceed on. Yeah, I don't know what the Puts legal. Puts it all on our back. Right, I don't know what the legal. I, I will get back with you and let you know. We can postpone it. You know, it's. I, I'm sure all this has been worked out in the legal system. I just can't answer it. So we'll we'll get back with you and let you know. Uh, we'll postpone this fight and we'll just. Uh, go through a slower process. That's what the... Mr. Hoskin? Uh, Mr. Hoskin? And in, in follow-up to that, I just wonder, let, let's say it's a, a private, uh, let's say the BOK Center is hosting an MMA, and the state regulates those boxers. I'm wondering, does this does the BOK Center and that promotion company sign a document in which they actually hold the state harmless? Same thing. So are we... We're not any different than any and other And I'm as concerned as Councilman Gloria Jordan is about it, but I, but I do wonder if we're actually being treated no different than every promotion company in the check world. On that I, I don't know the answer to that question. You know, no, no, but... And I yield to Mr. Madam Chairman, and, and, uh, and obviously, you know, being an attorney and being a, a, a plaintiff-minded attorney, I'm always cognizant of the... Uh, uh, the, the liability uh, issues that uh, uh, that may be out there. Uh, however, um, I, 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 have, I have heard that uh, uh, Cherokee Nation Enterprises has, you know, uh, planned this event for November 12th. They have uh, pre-sold tickets. They have already expended uh, uh, monies uh, for the promotion of uh, of this fight. Our uh, uh, tribal council meeting uh, will be prior to. Uh, uh, that fight, okay? Uh, what I would ask is the, the indulgence of Ms. Jordan and, and, the, and the tribal council members is uh, 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 to uh, go forward with the uh, with the compact right now and prior to the tribal council meeting itself, there will be a detailed <coughs> memorandum as to the 
the liability aspects of the, uh, the, the Cherokee Nation and Cherokee uh, Nation Enterprises. If we need to uh, table it at that point and those liability issues are, are not addressed, well, then you know, we, we can table it at full council. But uh, you know, if, if we table it now, all will stop. So I, I would suggest that, that that course of action happen. Uh, Mr. Yeah, I got two questions for you, David. If I go to a rock concert and a uh, fight breaks out, is the speaker fairly liable for that? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, other, other tribes have done this, I'm sure. You know, of course, I rely on history and I don't really hear of any problems, and we looked into that. So uh, we'll just, I, I think it's a good question and we should answer it. Uh, specifically, so we will. Um, I'm just hot. That was, I know you need to fight, and me and Todd to talk about it, and we're willing to pass it, just like Todd said, and get the questions answered. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could answer about the Potawatomi tribe and the right. other tribes, it'd be okay. So the question that Chuck raised, or other mm -hmm. tribes, and all okay with it. He's willing to answer your questions before. Okay. Let's get some of those done. And Council. Okay. Yeah, well, you can have your and, and I'm not. Anyway. I'm not against the additional revenue that this will bring in. I just think that this agreement should be a little bit better. From just my glancing at it, it's got some holes big enough to run a Mack truck through. Um, I will be voting to move this on to full council if I have your uh, word that you're going to work on these other issues prior to full council. I don't want to hold up your fight, right. but I see all of the things that can happen. It's great when it works, right. but I deal in the business of when it doesn't work. Right, as we do. <laughs> yeah. And when it doesn't work and you have this sort of agreement, it's going to come back right back and fall in your lap. Well, let me, let me address those issues. And if the council is comfortable, we'll move forward. And if it's not, then we'll, you know. Okay, one last comment from Mr. Hummingbird. Uh, uh, just those things keep in back of your mind. I'm sure Dave's going to cover it in his response. But uh, the promoters uh, are required to carry a, a very hefty insurance policy, and they do get releases from the fighters. So I, mean, I know that doesn't answer the question 100%, but that's something that is not necessarily spelled out within the compact that is a standard procedure for any sanctioning body for them to get the insurance. Could, could I just short response real quick? The short response to that is, when people get sued, we look for all pockets. <clears throat> we don't limit ourselves. We don't go for the biggest pocket we can find, and unfortunately, the biggest pocket is right there. Chop down versus the state. Mm -hmm. all, <clears throat> all in favor of this resolution authorizing a boxing martial arts compact with the state of Oklahoma, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. <clears throat> One no. Yes. Okay, item three is an amendment of, to the revenue and tax code. Mr. England. Yeah, thank you, Madam. Uh, down there. I would like to uh, defer to Andy here. Well, now we're buddies. I <laughs> This is a, uh, it's called a special per permits event. And the reason this came about is uh, mainly for CE, hard work and stuff. They have special permits on occasion that I'm going to use, for example, the art market coming up because that's what kind of brought this to our attention. Last year, uh, there was really no way for us to get to gauge how much uh, that each individual vendor sold. We did it on a, uh, we tried to do it on last year on a, a volunteer basis. Send us your sales receipts, send us in your 6% to the tribal uh, tax commission. Everything's golden. Well, that didn't work because 90% of them said, well, we didn't sell anything. So, Shocking. Yeah. In lieu of that, uh, tax commission with uh, CNE's people got together, our attorney general, and came up with a special permits, flat fee in lieu of tribal tax. Uh, what we do is we charge whoever the uh, event promoter is, art market, say, CNE's that, we charge them a flat fee, and they pass that fee on to as in their booth costs. And what I'm doing is just trying to get that done so we don't miss out on that revenue that we have in the past. And uh, that uh, fee is going to be determined by the tax commission, and it will be 
It will be taken in consideration what event is. We won't charge you know, the art market the same as we would a concert coming in selling CDs. That will be something separate. And we just kind of try to do what we feel is fair for all entities. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Madam Speaker, I would move for this approval. Second. But also we have a topographical error in there. I don't know if anybody knows it, but $50 it needs to be B, B hundred. Yep. Yeah. And I, I saw that on mine. I was told I got. I didn't get the newest one. But I will make sure that that is <coughs> fixed. Which yeah. yeah, it's 50 and it's supposed to be an initial fee of 100. On That's the application fee, yes ma'am. That's on page 3 in case you're looking for it. Anything, any further comments? All in favor, signify that uh, this is an act by acclamation, Mr. England? Yes, correct. All in favor, signify the saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. I am for is a resolution proposing an amendment to Article 9 of the Constitution um, requiring that all ballots cast in church and nation elections be done in person and at polling stations within the jurisdiction the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation. Ms. Fishinghall. Madam Speaker, I'm going to table this for one month. Second. Okay. A motion to table. Do I have a second? Yes, one. All in favor, signify the saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. <laughs> Motion carries. Uh, item 5 is a resolution requesting approval of the location of each precinct for the 2011 election. Uh, Ms. Cowan Watts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> and I apologize, I should have already had these maps handed out. There's one of each, and it shows the 18 and up, which is our potential voting population. I haven't seen any actual data from. Um, the election commission or anyone else concerning like how we would justify those precincts <coughs> and so there's two maps they're essentially the same map the one with the color when you get it is the 30 mile drive radius in the yellow indicates which it kind of turns colors over the population density but it shows what if it's colored yellow green blue looking then there's a 30 mile drive radius from that precinct which is a 2007 precinct now of course I believe there was three precincts removed uh, as proposed by the election commission and this body then approves what we do or don't do but it would be Bale in Adair County if I'm correct um, then Afton and also well no it's just the two but then <coughs> I believe this map shows that there is justification for an additional one at least in our district and possibly uh, other districts as well because where you don't see that yellow overlay that means somebody has to drive more than 30 minutes in our jurisdiction to get to a precinct and then of course um, you can see too that there's where there's black with no yellow overlay that means there's a high density population in that zip code that is not being served within 30 minutes by a precinct. Okay. Does the Election Commission, do they have copies of this? No. I, I don't know. so we can have discussion. And do you have a second? Second. Okay, open for discussion. So, Mr. Hoskin? I, I just wanted a question to pose to Ms. Count Watts. The precincts that are on this map are the existing precincts as of 2007? 2007. Right. So, Afton's in the upper right corner, mm -hmm. and Bell is bottom right, second up. Um, and one more question, Madam Chair. Sure. There's a letter from the Election Commission of September 27th in which it references a request from myself and then from you. Which do you, which precinct did you re recommend? A I recommended that we either put one at Ulagal or Tuala, and if you'll see in the map, 
that is a hole for our district. And, and, I, and I go and I want to yield back to Kara, but I have some questions about the elect, to the election commission about this letter. But I, I'll just I'll save that for after Ms. Count Watts has uh, finished her presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My in my proposal, I would have to amend my resolution to add uh, a precinct in Ulagal. Uh because right now it's just a proposed list from the election commission. Because I felt like after we saw the map, there would probably be others that wanted to add precincts. So I don't know who my second was, but I would like to add Ulagal. And Julia agrees. Dr. Coates. So you're <coughs> proposing a motion to amend to include Ulagal. Yes, Madam Speaker. Okay. And who second? I did, and I'll agree. Yes, that's right. And Mr. Hodges. And I'd offer a friendly to add after, which I believe would be. We have a friendly amendment from Mr. Hopkins mm -hmm. for Afton. And I accept. Mm -hmm. I do as well. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to add Muskogee. Muskogee. Uh, friendly amendment to add Muskogee. I accept. Okay. And Mr. Hopkins? Well, I still have my questions for the Election Commission, but I oh, think okay. there's others with friendly commitments. Fishing <coughs> Hawk? Yes, I'd like to add Bell as Ader County is the second biggest voting district. And now that we're with Delaware, I dare say we're going to be the biggest voting district out of the five. <coughs> Not a population, but yes, I'll accept. To add Bell. To add Bell. Okay. Well, that's okay. Would you vote us, please? I'm sorry, Madam Chairman. Could we could, we can't hear everything? Would you reiterate that? Sure. Before we uh, the, Kara is uh, suggest or uh, amending her resolution to add Ulagoff, and then there's been one for um, Afton, Muskogee, and Bell. Four. Yes. Um, Okay, any further discussion? Yes, Mr. Johnson. Yes, I would like the opportunity to read the letter for the, for the record. Okay. Recent events have surfaced as concern in precinct locations for the forthcoming 2011 election. The Commission has addressed those matters and met with Council's Attorney Todd Hembree and following our election timeline. This issue has in the past been resolved as required by our election rule, Section 2.03, in July of the year preceding the elections. As required, the Commission furnished this list to Council prior to the Rules Committee meeting in July. In selecting these precinct locations in view of the recently approved five districts, we have taken into account the size, population density, population centers, transportation access and distance to precinct locations that would best suit the majority of those voting in the election. In addition, the list that we have furnished was developed with consideration of past experience as well as the realignment of the districts. The Commission believes these locations to be reasonable and satisfies the needs of the voters. In the course of locating these precincts, we have also considered voter participation at each location in the past, and as a result, two of the precincts, Bell and Afton, were dropped from the list. Before such decision was made, we consulted by mail each voter registered to vote in these locations, listing their new precinct location and inviting any feedback from which there was none. The Commission has in the past and intends in the future to cooperate with those involved in the government as well as the electorate to provide each and every voter an opportunity to exercise their privilege of voting. Counselor's attorney, Mr. Hembree, was present at the commission September meeting and subsequent correspondence between him and commission's counsel. It was noted at that council that the council has yet to approve the precinct list submitted. Mr. Hembree noted that under Title 26, Section 61 of the Cherokee Nation Code, it provides that the Commission establish a location of the precinct subject to approval by Council resolution. To our knowledge, this provision has never been carried out since there is nothing in the archives of the Commission to indicate that a resolution was ever adopted in the past. 
Now that the list has been submitted to the council, the commission has been sensitive to and considered input from the council in establishing precinct locations. <coughs> in past elections, the final decision of these locations has always been entrusted to the commission. It appears that the statute is clear that the commission shall establish locations. We have received input from Councilor Hoskin and Watts suggesting additional precincts in their districts. We have given careful consideration to these requests. As a result, the Commission still believes that the precinct list that we previously furnished to you fully services the voting citizens of the Cherokee Nation. Pursuant to the previous stated factors in determining locations, it was our desire to establish the locations with consideration for each district's distinctive requirements and not simply equal number of locations in each district. Due to the litigation of redistricting, the Commission is behind in its timeline for preparation of the 2011 election. This change alone is undoubtedly going to create more confusion with voters and additional precincts locations will only further confuse the voters. We would respectfully request the Council to indulge the Commission's <coughs> experience and judgment approving the list of precincts that we have previously furnished you. Respectfully submitted the Council or the Commission. In addition to that, I want to point out the 99 Constitution, Article 9, Section 1. It says there is hereby created a Cherokee Nation Election Commission. The Commission shall be an autonomous and permanent entity charged with the administration of all Cherokee Nation elections in, accord in accordance with the election laws. The Council shall enact an appropriate law not inconsistent with the provisions of this Constitution that will govern the, contact, uh, the conduct of all elections. The definition of autonomous is self-governing, independent, subject to its own laws, and not subject to control or interference from the outside. And we believe that the Council adding precincts at this time is inconsistent with the Constitution. And uh, we, we believe that what we have done, the research that we have done, is in full compliance with the Constitution. And by adding precincts or making a change this late, <coughs> it is not uh, in conjunction with the Constitution. That's, that's all. Mr. Hoskins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and let me say, Mr. Johnson, I, I appreciate the work of the Commission. I know it's much harder on the front end to figure out where precincts should be than to figure out on the back end where you should have put them in second guessing. I say that having been one of the counselors who's wanted to change what you've done. <coughs> it sounds like it's the position of the Commission that the statute that requires us to, whether it's been used or not, the statute that requires us to effectuate your decision through a resolution, it sounds like the Commission's position is it's unconstitutional. Exactly. You pointed out that the Commission is an autonomous body. I mean, the courts are an autonomous body. We pass statutes all the time. The state of Oklahoma passes statutes all the time for its courts. The federal government passes statutes all the time for its courts. I mean, for example, we could pass a statute saying there needs to be a district courthouse everywhere in the nation. I mean, the courts may not like it, but the legislature will have spoken <coughs> because we want to give people access to the courts. There's an analogy to be drawn here. We want people to have access to the polls. Now, the courts may come to us and say, look, we're autonomous. We don't think we need a courthouse in every district. You're crazy. And we may say, well, we disagree. We think we do. And, and I think, and of course, the, the court may ultimately rule on this, I, I think we went out on that. I think we went out on that issue. Having said that, um, in your letter you say that if we add precincts, it will confuse voters. And I'm, I'm curious, on what basis would voters be confused by having a precinct closer to where they live? Not eliminating a precinct, adding a precinct. Well, in, in some instances, uh, and I'm going to use Afton as, as an example, uh, the people that lived uh, north uh, of the lake were in Old District 5, I believe it was. I'm not, I've got a map in front of me, but I believe it was 5. And uh, now they're in, in another district. They're in the new District 4. 
and uh, we only had 50 voters, 51 or 52 voters in the last election. And, and you know, we, we discussed this and we felt like most of those voters came from the north side of the lake. Well, they're not in that district anymore. And by eliminating that district, you know, those people that are in the, the new district have the option to go to the NIDA. And, and some of it also was based on population of, of that area. You don't think that between now and the time of the election that there'll be enough education, not just by the commission, but by the various campaigns as to where people are to vote? I mean, my experience, which I admit is not very deep, but my experience is that voters tune in much more to where they're supposed to vote as election day draws near. We're going to have certainly new voters in this election as we vote <coughs> the election. And I just think that as we draw closer, people will educate themselves as to where they vote. And it just seems to me that if we're going to eliminate precincts, there's got to be real compelling reasons to do it. And I just I haven't heard the compelling reason yet. I, I heard cost at one point, and it looks like cost wasn't as uh, as high as, as I thought it might be. I think, and I could be wrong, Madam Speaker, but I think it was $750 a precinct. Cost doesn't seem to be much of an issue. So the other issue is confusion. And I think if you have to balance giving people more places to vote, and they can educate themselves as they get closer, versus the potential for confusion, which I think is a little speculative. The idea that there'll be so much confusion out there that people, in fact, will have difficulty accessing the polls. I think that more precincts wins out every time. I think it wins out every time. Now, we could, we could put a precinct on every corner and say, boy, they have maximum opportunity, then it would be a cost issue. But what we're, do, what we're really talking about is restoring a couple of places where people had voted before. Maybe not very many compared to some precincts, but um, I think there's probably been some demographic changes in some of these areas where you might see a, a spike in voting this time. So I, I respect the commission, but I respectfully disagree with, number one, your assertion that the law is unconstitutional, and number two, the policy decision you've made, which is that those precincts should be eliminated. Again, I respect your work, just respectfully disagree with the conclusions you drew. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My, my response to you is that in July, we attended the meeting, and, and prior to that meeting, we, we submitted our list of uh, uh, locations, precinct locations. At that time, uh, we requested that any of the commissioners or, or council that had any heartburn with that to come to our next meeting or to email us or contact us in some way. And there was only one that did, and that was Councillor Watts. And by email, and she requested a, another precinct in her district. And then it was the meeting this, we didn't hear from anyone else. And then our meeting this month, Mr. Henry came to that meeting with some requests for additional. And I, I don't recall how many was on that request because we didn't really listen to his argument. However, it, it seems that since that time, now there's even more. <laughs> Now, now there's even more, and uh, you know we got to stop somewhere. I'm not, I'm not sure you know how the legislative group is going to come to a conclusion, you know, as to how many additional uh, precincts or reestablishing precincts is going to happen. And I still believe that that is the job of the commission. The intent of the Constitution is that we administer. We're, we're the administrator of the election. And the location of precincts is part of that administration. Okay. Um, Ms. Gloria Jordan. Um, I would like to offer a friendly amendment. Um, doesn't have to do with precincts, but it, what it has to do with, and I think it's a given, but I just want to make sure I am understanding it right, that all precincts shall be established within the original boundaries of the Cherokee Nation. I believe that's a given. But I, we're getting awful close to the boundary lines in some areas, and I just want to make sure that we fall over inside the 14 counties. So I would ask for you to consider that as a friendly amendment. Uh, Mr. Embry, <coughs> did you have a comment regarding that? Isn't it? Is it state somewhere that must be within the jurisdiction? Precincts must be within the jurisdiction boundary okay. of the Cherokee as Nation. Muskogee the will be on the uh, on the jurisdiction the half the Cherokee side. Okay. okay. Is, is, then I withdraw my uh, amendment. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't somehow get somewhere where we shouldn't be. Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker. Jack Baker. Yes. I also take issue with the interpretation 
of the Constitution by the Election Commission because it says that the Election Commission <coughs> shall be charged with the administration of all check commission elections. And I said setting precincts is not necessarily administration, running the election. But it says in accordance with election laws. So I said this body has the authority to establish the precincts. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Soap. Yes, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, we can stop after we add uh, Spavano. I'd like to uh, <laughs> add a friend link if we add Spavano to the list of precincts. I'll accept. Thank you. Uh, Do we have the acceptance? Mr. Hopkins? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll be brief. It, it's surely not your position that if Afton and the other had been raised in September that you would have reached a different conclusion. Your conclusion is based on the confusion of the voters. Would the two months have made a difference? I doubt it. Thank you, Mr. Um, Mrs. Morton. May I go ahead, since Mrs. Morton? Did you have a comment? It was just a question that we had talked about to know exactly where the Muscogee site is, and I just came to ask Todd where it is actually located, and my answer was that it angles over, and part of it is in our boundary line. So that was my question from conversation that we had had when we were trying to determine all of the, the places. And thank you very much. I got my answer. <laughs> Uh, Ms. Watts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I appreciate uh, the body's willingness to come to the table because I was concerned about this uh, regardless of whose responsibility is perceived to be. I believe our responsibility is to encourage voter participation. <laughs> regardless of past voter participation, increased precinct availability and location to our voters would increase, and I thought that was something everyone agreed on at the Cherokee Nation, was that we needed to increase voter turnout. So at the budget, when the budget came forward and we increased the budget, I thought that this would include all of this. Um, so I'm excited about the body's uh, receptiveness to actually making it more accessible to our Cherokee voters because that's why I brought this forward and I think this is exciting that we're all on board and I would welcome more sponsors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Mr. Henry, do you have Yes, Madam Chairman. Um, and, and just to uh, uh, add some additional information, um, uh, Mr. Baker was correct to point out that the uh, election commission is to administer the, uh, the elections of the Cherokee Nation in accordance with the laws <laughs> Uh, of the, uh, the Cherokee Nation and the laws of the Cherokee Nation are obviously created by the, uh, uh, the, the Tribal Council of the Cherokee Nation. And our law, our election law, uh, our most uh, uh, recent amendments there to Legislative Act uh, 0610, uh, Section 61, as, as correctly said, that, we, that the Election Commission shall establish locations of each precinct, but there's a caveat, subject to approval by council resolution. And any council resolution can be amended and uh, both delete, uh, both added to or taken away from. Um, and so uh, the, the procedure is correct uh, that the, the council is doing. We, uh, uh, the, the election commission has done uh, great work, Gilman's work, did great research, came with additional, uh, came, came with the proposed uh, precincts, uh, uh, locations, reported in July. Uh, the, the not the very next meeting, but the but but, but the one after that, from July, August, September, uh, uh, the council uh, representative asked me to uh, go and respectfully request additional precinct locations, and and uh, and those uh, uh, locations uh, were, were were not addressed. This is the process by which the the, the law has set forward, both under the constitution and of uh, the. Um, uh, and of the laws of the Cherokee Nation. Additionally, this process has been entertained before. In the in yeah, prior to the 1999 election, there was a resolution approving uh, uh, resol uh, uh, precinct locations, and in 2003, there was a resolution approving precinct locations. I did not find one for 2007, uh, but I, I, I am still looking. However, this is a process that must be adhered to because, uh, frankly, 
uh, and, and with my uh, uh, talk with Mr. Cole, the, the election commission attorney, uh, failure to approve uh, 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 precinct locations by resolution uh, could bring into question the election process uh, when we when we go forward. So whatever lo uh, locations are finally decided on, it is imperative that the council approve it by resolution. And I just want to uh, make those. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Fulbright? Yes, thank you. To me, the, the goal should be <coughs> better voter participation. And I've always wanted to see us have a voting precinct at the Nycut Belfont area because we have, if you look at this map, it's much longer for them to go down to Mulberry than it is for Marble City folks to come down to Salisaw. I'm not going to switch one for the other, but we have always Need a precinct there. I make a family amendment that we. I have said the list. And Chewy. My cut Belfont. Chewy. My cut Belfont and Chewy. It's, yeah, their community buildings together. Okay, Mr. Fishing Hawk. Okay, Mr. Johnson. Can I make a statement? Sure. The, the map that's been passed around in this conversation that we're having, uh, respecting every counselor here. This is something we should have done months ago. Regardless of whether we were looking at nine uh, districts or five districts or 15 districts, we probably all should have got together then and we wouldn't be having this argument now. And, uh, you know, may maybe the commission was amiss in not, you know, looking at this information that CARE has presented. I wish we'd have had this just a month ago. You know, maybe information like this would have uh, persuaded us, you know, to, to view it in a different light. Uh, and again, back in July, we asked for input from the council at that time. And again, until now, or until <laughs> Mr. Henry showed up uh, two weeks ago, we really got none. We got one from Mrs. Watts. <coughs> Any other comments, questions? Yes, Ms. Warden. We have looked at the time factor, and Mark Calco has spent years on this commission. And she probably has the time factor, say, October, November, December, January, February. I've written it down. But since I only did it one time last time, Martha's done it five, six, seven. She's really got it all down. Would you tell them the time <coughs> factor, how you vote is up to you? And, of course, we know that. But we're getting really close with three workers and all. And uh, we need to be rational and do what's good for all of us. And we need to look at the time factor. Mark, would you would you go over it, please? Since you seem to be the rest of the forward. That was a concern that I have. What, what the time factor going to really bad affect your the process here, <coughs> Madam Chair? I do I do know this. If we don't do something soon, we're going to have a hard time having an election. <coughs> and you've got to remember that our election records over there are still nine districts. We're not in five districts yet because the court had not ruled. So we've got all this to do. <coughs> I can tell you that it's five months and seven days until you file. I can tell you that it's eight months and 25 days to the election. We don't resolve it today. We put, as Ms. Watt said, we take Oolagoff and we establish <coughs> We've got to put voters at Oolagoff and somewhere. So we're going to have to write to our voters, Claremore, Chelsea, all those that live there, and say, this is available. Do you want to change? That'll take us 30 days. We ought to allow them 30 days to answer it, get it back, get them in the precincts. Okay, all this is going to take time. If you don't decide today, then we're talking about 
January 1 at the very earliest we can do. <coughs> February 7, you can request absentee ballot. We don't even need a district. <coughs> we need to decide today. Any questions for Ms. Calico or Mr. Dalton? Mr. I, I don't know. I just have a final comment. I don't. Uh, I appreciate the the large task we've asked the election commission to undertake, and that there are issues outstanding. Uh, but none of those affect the idea that our jurisdictional boundaries do not change, or that the population deserves to have a precinct as close as possible to them within 30. These are all things we should have addressed years ago. And I'm glad that we're not, we're stopping today, drawing a line in the sand and saying, we want more people to vote in our elections. And we should act today. We should keep moving forward. And this is an opportunity to change that 14,000 number that seems to stagnate in our Cherokee elections since the 70s when we started the blue card in voting. So I'm excited and it sounds like at our next executive and finance meeting that there needs to be a proposed budget change and we need to work hard on our end to find out if we need to staff additional people or contracts at to accommodate <coughs> uh, precincts and any staff that they may need to make sure that we increase voter turnout. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. In, in the spirit of trying to expedite this, uh, I think we have a requirement that we would have to have a special meeting and have the commission vote upon additional precinct locations and represent it to the council. So we would request that as soon as possible you get that list to us so we can convene a special meeting to take that vote and present it. Mr. Dr. Cobb and then Mr. Hoskins. I just had a question uh, from Councilor Fulbright. Was that a <coughs> motion for Chewy? Did we vote on that? Is that on the table? Clerk and Mr. It was a friendly mm -hmm. amendment, Chewy and Belfon. Okay, so that is still, have we voted on that? That's on the table. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Mr. Hoskins. Just briefly, a question to Todd. Is that is he is Mr. Johnson correct on the procedure? I mean, if we pass this here, we're going to pass it at full council. Those are the precincts. That's correct. You know, I mean, <laughs> at, at this point, what would happen if, if if this is passed? You know, ultimately by the full tribal council, those are the precincts. That's what that's the uh, in accordance with the law. That that's the game we're playing with. Very good. Thank you. I, I made that statement just yeah. because I want to make sure that we were covered. Sure. You know. Uh, one more comment, Mr. Glory Jordan. I, I do want to ask, how much is it a precinct? What is the cost? It's approximately seven hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. For, for the smaller. This resolution signified by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Item 6 is an act amending the election law covering employee qualification for elective office. Uh, Dr. Cobb. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It seems to be Constitution Day here at the Council. <laughs> um, <clears throat> with your indulgence, uh, there are there's item number 6 and 7, and these two acts are inextricably li uh, linked together, and uh, discussion of one must include the other. So with your permission, one of these acts um, seeks to amend the Cherokee and Nation Election Code by adding provisions for overlapping elected terms, which is item number seven. One of these seeks to amend the Cherokee and Nation Election Code by repealing a section of the current Cherokee and Nation Election Code. That's item number six. Um, this is actually a constitutional quandary which exists at the federal level, but it applies directly to the Cherokee Nation. Because um, essentially we follow a small version of, of what is called the Hatch Act, which I have placed in front of all of you. If somebody doesn't have one, let me know. <clears throat> um, to fully understand this quandary, a, a brief look at the U.S. law and the U.S. Constitution is in order because it directly applies to our situation. <coughs> the Hatch Act, which you have a copy of, was originally passed in 1939. It was amended in 74 and 93. And this act spells out what is and is not legal regarding federal employees' involvement in political campaigns and elections. 
please note, I believe it's on the bottom, roughly the bottom right-hand side of that Hatch Act, federal employees are barred from running for political office in partisan elections. A look at the United States Constitution, which is the basis of the U.S. government. Article 1, Section 2 and 3, which is the Qualifications Clause, deals only with age, citizenship, and place of residence. Notice that nowhere does the U.S. Constitution specifically state that federal employees are barred for running for political office. The U.S. Supreme, uh, typically in these situations, uh, as Councilor Hoskin pointed out correctly, I may add, a lot of times we look at what the courts say. Well, unfortunately, at the, at the federal level, the court is fairly vague because in two cases, um, there are many, but I picked out two, the U.S. Supreme Court agrees with the Constitution. U.S. Term Limits Advocacy Group v. Thornton, 1995, the U.S. Supreme Court stated that the qualifications contained in Article I, Sections 2 and 3 of the U.S. Constitution are exclusive and Congress has no authority to add to them. In Powell v. McCormick in 1969, the U.S. Supreme Court held that Article I, Section 5 of the U.S. Constitution does not give the House of Representatives or the Senate the authority to exclude any person duly elected by its constituents who meets all requirements for membership expressively, expressively prescribed in the Constitution. Then they go back. The U.S. Supreme Court seems to agree with the Hatch Act. In 1990, in Rutan versus Republican Party, they uphold the, the Hatch Act's ability to, to govern what is basically legal. In 1947, there was a case, United Public Workers v. Mitchell, where they essentially said the same thing. So at best, what you have is a very vague interpretation. Is the Constitution correct or is the, is the, or the courts correct? Unfortunately, um, we have this quandary at the, at the Cherokee Nation. If you're a constitutionalist at the federal level, um, it is entirely uh, actually, uh, possible that you would submit that the Hatch Act is illegal. If you are someone that believes that, uh, that law can trump the Constitution without an amendment, then the Hatch Act is perfectly legal. So how does this apply to the current Cherokee Nation Constitution? Uh, both, both uh, law, the law is in front of you in the form of item number six and number seven, uh, the acts. One, again, one of which asks you to add to the Cherokee Nation election law, uh, which would be item number seven, and the other which actually asks you to repeal a section of the Cherokee Nation election law, which is item number six. So what does the Cherokee Nation Constitution say about that? Well, Article 7, I mean, excuse me, Article 6, Section 3 deals with qualification requirements and deals only with age, <coughs> citizenship, and place of residence, very similar to the United States Constitution. Also in Article 9, Section 2, it deals with crimes and membership, employment, and another Native American tribe. You also have a memo in front of you from the council attorney. Um, and, but, and also notice in our Constitution, nowhere does it state that an elected official must resign for their position or that an employee of the Cherokee Nation must resign their position to run for political office. Per Todd's memo, that, that is exactly what that says. That would be, on the uh, elected official side of it, that would be what's called a resign to run amendment to the, to the Cherokee Nation Constitution. Conversely, by that thinking, um, if you use that thinking, the Cherokee Nation Constitution does not say that an employee must re resign to run for political office. So, my, uh, my assumption is, per Todd's memo, if Act 2 is passed, which is elected officials, it is entirely possible without a resign to run amendment that it violates the Cherokee Nation Constitution. If Act 1, which is employee candidates, is not passed, it is entirely possible uh, that the election law is in violation of the Cherokee Nation <coughs> Constitution. Um, the question has been brought forth, why did I bring forth be both pieces of legislation? The answer is this. I do not believe that a discussion and passage of a law can occur without both sides of the coin being exposed. If you are opposed to Act Number 2, which deals with elected officials and, and overlapping terms, you must concede that part of your opposition centers on, the, on that if passed, this act possibly violates the Cherokee Nation Constitution. Furthermore, if you decide you're also opposed to Act 1, which is Number 6 on your agenda, the Employee Candidate Act, 
then you have to concede that your concern over violations of Cherokee Nation Constitution extend only so far as how it affects elected officials and not the general citizenry. With that being said, I would move for approval of item number six on the agenda, Madam Speaker. I have a second. I'll second for discussion purposes. A motion and a second. Now discussion. Uh, Mr. Hoffman. Um, well, Madam Speaker, I, Council Cobb has mixed the two pieces of legislation in his introduction. So I guess we're not too far afield from debating both issues at once. I mean, I, we usually pick up one at a time, but uh, are we dealing with both of these? Or uh, he made item? the motion on item six. That's it. That covers his motion. I, I, and then I'm assuming you want to bring up item seven following Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, I appreciate that. Well, first off, I, I have talked to Council McCobb before about the issue of Advantages of incumbency and what we might do to resolve that. I can say sincerely that he's quite sincere when he says that he's concerned about these issues. So I don't doubt the councilman's sincerity in wanting to make sure that we do what we can to level playing fields. I think the first act is something that certainly worthy of consideration. You know, the Hatch Act that we passed out is actually a law under which I labor. I'm a, I'm a federal employee, and one of the issues when I sought office was, am I in violation of the Hatch Act? In fact, it was I wasn't. It wasn't a partisan office. But the constitutional trade-off for me as a federal employee was I gave up my right to seek partisan office. Now, I suppose reasonable people can disagree as to whether that's constitutional, but the courts have said it is constitutional. And that's about the end of it. We can still have an academic debate about it, but they've said it's unconstitutional. Um, I've got... I, 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 I'm inclined to support the idea that employees can run because I really do think we have to make sure we have a, a pool of candidates that's deep and we have a lot of employees that are very talented who, who may want to seek office and is this an unnecessarily, unnecessary barrier to them. So I think it's good that we at least debate this issue. I think this issue is so important and so complicated that it would be, I'd be a bit taken aback if we could actually do this all in one day. Just, just number six alone. I mean, at the federal level, there's an entire office in the Justice Department designed to regulate this Hatch Act, <coughs> designed to investigate allegations. That's a, that's a tremendous commitment of resources because if we don't stand up and commit the resources to regulate this act, it'll really become almost a meaningless law because employees will, will know they have this right but will it, be, will it be enforced? Will they feel like they're protected in engaging in those activities? Um, so I think we've got to be very deliberate in our approach on how we approach number six. So I think number six, I don't remember six on the agenda is certainly fair game. I don't see how item number six and item number seven, as the councilman put it, is inextricably linked. The fact of the matter is we could have had months and years of debate on the subject that's at issue in number six without <coughs> touching number seven. And, and frankly, I think we would have because I think the principal chief is driving number seven. I don't know if there's a person in this room that doesn't believe it. And the only reason that number seven is being pushed by the principal chief is because his chief opponent is Councilman Bill John Baker, who's in the middle of a term. Number seven will only affect Councilman Baker. And the timing is unmistakable. So I'm a little troubled that we have to muddy up what I think is a, a very much a legitimate thing to spend our time talking about number six with something that is really a political hatchet, hatchet job by the principal chief against his only opponent, his only opponent on the council. I think that's what is driving number seven. I don't think they're in a strict blue link with all due respect. I think if we want to have a serious debate about number six, we can do it without number seven. If we want to have the debate about number seven, though, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to do it, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cobb? Um, and I appreciate your comments. I, mean, I think you probably know how much I respect your opinion. I. Um, I've been asked this question, and, and I've answered it at the federal level for this, and, and, and I've said these kind of things over the past three years 
before, and it always goes back to, I, I run a business. And I find it somewhat of a disparity that, let's say that I have a $140,000 a year job with benefits. And I can say, you know what, I'm not really sure that there isn't something better. I'm going to go run for this job over here. Well, that's exactly what happened in the, in the presidential election, the last presidential election. We had two people that were senators, and they said, well, I think there's, there's, the grass is green over here. I want to be president of the United States. One won and one didn't. The other that didn't goes back and is now a senator. Well, that's like me going back to my $140,000 a year job and saying, you know, actually this job's really good. I I'm kind of glad I'm back. Well, it's a little too late now. I mean, you basically put out there that, you know, I don't think this is quite as important as this. If you're asking what I personally think, um, I think the answer is to solve the employee issue, is exactly what I think. So I'm not telling you that your line of thinking is exactly wrong, but um, that's exactly where I'm, that, that's why I think they're inextricable. The, the question was put forth the, or the statement that you didn't think, in my mind they are, and that's why. I don't think it's, an, it's fair to an employee to say, well, an elected official can decide which job is better, but you can't. Um, I don't think that's, unfair, that's fair to employees. If the focus has shifted to elected officials in this, maybe that's just part of the, of the, of the gamut. But my focus is I don't think it's, it's fair to an employee to say, well, it's okay for them, but you can't do this. So that's where I'm coming from. I'm sorry. <coughs> the further. Uh, Mr. Schultz. Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Councillor Hoskin mentioned that it might take a while to uh, discuss this. So I'm just curious, are there any time limits on this uh, so far, or do I have a little bit of time to... That's a good question. I'll give you each of, anybody that wants to talk about two minutes. Okay, two minutes. Shelley, I'll be quick then. Time? <coughs> I guess the thing I want to clarify is that, that this act essentially um, paves the way for an employee to run uh, for office. And so as an example, I'll just use somebody I know and familiar with who's an employee. Are, are we saying that Charlie So can go out and run for chief or a tribal council position, and the nation will pay him until the day he takes the oath of office. Is is that essentially what we're we're saying? And I don't think we. Uh, all, all due respect, Chris. Uh, let's not use people's names. <laughs> 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 I'll make it personal so I can understand it. <laughs> Mr. Henry, did you want to comment on that? Well, and, and if, if I might also be brief, um, um, if you've heard me say this once, you've heard me say it hundreds of times, words mean things, okay? Uh, the Cherokee Nation Constitution is very clear about what qualifications one must have in order to run for office. Uh, the Cherokee Nation uh, Constitution is correct that it does not say that you have to resign your elected office in order to run for office. Uh, it also does not say that you must resign your, um, uh, your employment to run for office. Uh, it does say that you cannot hold any position of, honest, uh, of profit, uh, honor, or trust in any other Indian tribe. It does, it does have that requirement. Uh, I do believe that we should stick strictly to the qualifications of the uh, uh, set forth in the Constitution. Uh, what Mr. Soap had, had brought out, though, is, is a very important uh, policy issue. Uh, you know, do we pay someone to go out and campaign? Uh, and, and I think that's a, that's a very legitimate uh, uh, point. Or, uh, versus the the opposite issue is that are we uh, that Mr. Hoskins, uh, Hoskins uh, brought forward? Do we eliminate a whole pool of candidates that you know are uh, obviously <coughs> interested in helping the Cherokee people, or they wouldn't be here working? Okay, so those are the two school of thoughts in in the the employee situation. One idea that that I uh, uh, <coughs> set up the sent up the flagpole, so to speak, would 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 be this is that uh, we, uh, uh, a suggestion that an employee not have to resign in order to run for uh, 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 nation's office, political office. 
uh, however, uh, at the time of filing, that they take an unpaid leave of absence. Uh, and when lose or, or, or if, if, if they lose, they, they are not fired from the position. They can, you know, go back to their old positions. You're, in that instance, you're not paying someone to uh, run for political office. And on the other hand, you're not saying that one is going to uh, uh, lose a job that they may have invested years in service into. I see that my time is up. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll end my comments. Thank you. Um, Ms. Thank you. Personally, I thought about this a lot, and I think an employee should be allowed to run for higher office without resigning. We see it every day in the state and federal level. Just for example, our uh, DA right now is in a race, and one of his employees is running against him. And I don't see that he has to uh, resign. Oh, that one lost. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the one <laughs> in the past election, I'll put it that way. One of them did. Yeah. That was an assistant ran. And uh, I just think that uh, we shouldn't be afraid of the competition out there. And I see that is the way it's looked at. It's like, I mean, more the merrier. If you ever can get out of the campaign and... Uh, but of course not be campaigning during work hours. And as Mr. Embry said, maybe they should resign, not resign, but uh, take a leave of absence. And that's, I just think it's okay for employees to run for higher office. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. And if, if we want to model this after the Hatch Act, I think it's right to strike the language that appears in um, Section 31B1. But I, I think we I think we have to put something in there because we have to get some. I assume there's going to be some regulations that would issue from this, and those regulations would would sort of set. I mean, this the the matter speaking the, the items in, in in this Hatch Act summary actually appear in a lot of federal regs, so they were developed after the Hatch Act was passed and evolved over the years. So but there has to be some statutory authority to issue these kind of regulations. So my only suggestion to the councilman is, is some language that says, you know, employees who seek office uh, shall not engage in political activity on working hours or something like that. <coughs> that way some regulations can flow from there. But I have one more question for Councilman Cobb. If we pass number six and, and we do nothing else, we don't pass number seven, are, are, aren't we then consistent? We've said employees, you can run, and we've said council members in the middle of the term, they can run. <laughs> is that the case? Yes. Uh, which th that's why it begs the question for me: Why in the world does item number seven appear on our agenda today? And I know why it appears on our agenda, but I think we should focus our time on number six. And it's much easier to do so if we got out of the context of again what I'll say is a political hatchet job against a sitting council member designed to either wreck his his public service career or wreck his campaign. That's what item number seven is about. If we want to have a serious dialogue on item number six, it should be done outside of the context of item number seven. It's tough to take the toothpaste out of the tube, though, Madam Speaker, and put the toothpaste back in the tube because we've already got into a discussion on number seven. So I think we really ought to have a good, frank discussion about number six. And number seven, frankly, ought to be withdrawn. And I, and I know Madam Speaker would allow the councilman that grace. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Mr. So. Yeah, Madam Speaker, I noticed uh, Mr. Patello's in our audience today, and I was wondering if I could yield some of my time to him to comment on this decision we might have on our employees. Yield to Mr. Vitello. Oh, yes. Mr. Vitello, you want to come forward? Well, I would just say first, uh, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding uh, HR policy. Uh, there is no HR policy that prevents an employee from running for political office. Uh, as all of you know, there is the act that prohibits that. Um, I would further uh, comment that uh, in regard to leaves of absence, you know, <coughs> those are typically things that an employee is not automatically entitled to, uh, with the exception maybe of family medical leave. Uh, as you probably know, leaves of absence must be applied for, requested, and they are uh, contingent upon the approval of management. 
So those would be my comments if you have further questions. Yes, I've got one uh, additional question, um, Mr. Patel, and that, and that is you've got years of expertise. And so what are, what are some of the, the uh, potential conflicts that, that this um, act would maybe generate? I mean, there, that you can think of a lot of things that, that uh, where there's conflicts of interest. What are some of those things that we can maybe consider as, as we uh, consider this very important issue? I mean, because there's a reason yeah. why the act was generated in the first place, and I just kind of like a refreshment of why that was, why somebody thought that was such a great idea to bar yeah. employees. It's because, you know, there's some issues out there. I would just like to refresh the phone. Mr. Chairman, you have 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, that is, uh, that, of course, was an act of this council. I don't know that I could comment the rationale for that. I, I would say that, uh, as you probably know, we have a policy that prohibits political activity during working hours, and I think that's one of the primary concerns from an employment perspective. Time up. Seven seconds. Seven more seconds, Mr. Schultz. Who follows <laughs> up on that, monitoring that activity? Is that their manager, or is that <clears throat> marshal service, tribal council? It would probably be, if, if I could respond to that, uh, it would probably be uh, first with management, as with any policy. Management has a responsibility to ensure that employees follow policy. Thank you, Mr. Pacello. Uh, Ms. Cal Watts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, this has been a great and interesting discussion. So when I, I looked at it, I looked at them as separate issues. I still believe they're intertwined and that we do have to assess uh, levels of fairness uh, from everyone's perspective. But ultimately, I think we're tasked with what's fair to the tribe in serving the people. So from just the employee perspective, and I'll save my two minutes to the next one on the other issue, but just on the employee level, I think it's unfair to expect the employee uh, the management of that employee, the people involved with that, and the tribe um, to be put forth with tasks with trying to get the resources to monitor whether or not they're doing something on tribal time or not. It's already bad enough as it is, even with just people helping with campaigns on their own time, but let alone a candidate. Then it wouldn't be unfair to the tribe if that candidate was critical of the tribe or the department that they were part of and expected to come back. Like if we did entertain the leave of absence. And then, how is it fair to some employees, if some employees are granted a leave of absence because they're in a non-sensitive department, but others aren't? It, do we just blanket allow everyone to run? I mean, that's two or three thousand or three thousand plus employees that probably are pretty angry with us about some decision we made <laughs> that will probably <laughs> decide to come out and run all over the time. So who's going to be at work to serve the chair? <laughs> So if I just look at just this issue, it, we can't guarantee fairness to the employee. We can't guarantee any kind of fairness at the management level that they would have to make sure that the employees are there, or is their job covered, and we got all this other stuff. So I don't see changing it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes. <coughs> Mr. Garvin? Yes, Madam Speaker. As a former employee of the Cherokee Nation, I was a teacher at Sequoia for about eight years. and. Uh, a teacher works works about 18 hours a day, usually grading papers and all this stuff. And anyone running for office might work 20 hours a day. <coughs> You're working 18 hours at Sequoia, and you got a campaign and uh, 20 hours. That just doesn't work out. <coughs> if I was temporarily gone, who's going to teach us kids? Somebody's got to teach them while I'm gone. So that's not going to work. So, uh, I don't know. You can't serve two masters. You're going to love one and hate the other. Uh, it's just a terrible deal. But, uh, may, I, may I rebut that? Uh, Mr. Fishinghop, yes. I withdraw. Uh, Mr. Crittenden. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I didn't work for the tribe when I ran for council the first time, but I worked for the federal government. And, uh, and I was subject to the Hatch Act. And you have to, you can't park except in certain places. You can't park on property that belongs to the government there. 
uh, even though it was nonpartisan, I felt like I should do those same kind of uh, precautionary measures. Uh, Mr. Botello said there was employee uh, rules or regulations in place to uh, uh, tell us how we can or cannot uh, function as an employee of the tribe if we want to run for office. And when his cousin's comment a while ago, I think responsible people who have a, have a uh, desire to serve our, serve our tribe or our people, when they hit the, the time clock, I think they'll take care of the nation's business. <coughs> responsible people. Now, there may be some that won't, but their supervisors will take care of that. I mean, <laughs> but the majority of the folks, I think, that work for us that would aspire to work to run for office, I think when they're on the clock, they're going to take care of their job. And when they're off the clock, they ought to be free to campaign and have hog fries and pitch horseshoes or whatever they want to do. So uh, I kind of like this item six. I'm like Chuck. I think item seven ought to be pulled. But uh, that's <coughs> Thank you. Dr. Cobb, final comment? I have nothing, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to we have a motion and a second. Uh, uh, this is an act, so roll call. Acclamation is fine, Madam Speaker. Acclamation. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Call. I'd ask for a roll call, please. Julia Tetz? No. Bradley Cobb? Yes. Joe Crittenden? Yes. Jody Fishinghop? Yes. Mary Friendly? No. Janelle Fulbright? Okay. Don Garvin? No. Chuck Hoskin Jr.? Yes. Tina Thurry Jordan? I pass. Chris Soap? Abstain. Curtis Snell? Abstain. David Thornton? No. Kara Cowan Watts? No. Bill Anglin? No. Bill John Baker? Yes. Jack Baker? No. Harley Buzzard? No. <coughs> no. Tyler Glory Jordan? Yes. We have six yes, nine no, and two abstentions. <coughs> nine no and two abstentions. <coughs> Motion fails. <coughs> On the item seven, uh, Dr. Cobb. I withdraw item number seven, Madam Speaker. Okay. Your sponsor is withdrawing item number seven. Okay, item <coughs> eight is uh, an act relating to creation of jobs growth. Uh, Mr. Hopkins, it is after three o'clock. Is it imperative that we discuss it today? It's or not. It was discussion only. I could table it until uh, next week. And on item nine, uh, the travel expense policy, there's nothing critical, just some disclosure items. So uh, I would entertain a motion to table. So moved. Thank you. All in favor of tabling, signify by saying aye. 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 All those the same sign. Did I get a motion on item eight to table? I mean, you Not to table. Yeah. No, we did vote on it. No, we have no. not voted on it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> motion to approve. Motion to table and second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. All the folks, same side. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Item. Yeah. 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 The resolution on the information. <laughs> we have a card. Pardon? Yeah, I thought we were on my resolution at the end. I thought we'd gone through that on 10. My apologies, Madam Speaker. Attention. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> okay, item 10 is the item added by Ms. Kara County Watts. Move um, to approve. Second. Second. There's a second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to any announcement. That's motion to All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. We are adjourned. I thought you were holding this. <laughs>